Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. Jonathan Meyer on how to improve adherence through optimizing communication strategies and collaborative care for patients with schizophrenia. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast description page or go to nei.global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as Drs. Cutler and Meyer discuss the current research on treating and managing schizophrenia. Hello and welcome to another NEI CME podcast. I'm Dr. Andrew Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of Neuroscience Education Institute. And today's podcast is going to be on optimizing communication, collaboration, and choices to improve adherence and outcome in schizophrenia. And with me today is my good friend and one of the smartest guys I know and a perfect person to be talking about this topic with is Dr. Jonathan Meyer. How are you doing? Fine, Andy, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, and I really look forward to this today because this is a little different than the uh, usual programs that we do. We're going to be talking really about where the rubber meets the road in how we actually communicate with our patients and take care of them. And of course, schizophrenia, taking care of patients with schizophrenia is a team sport. It's, it's not just the doctor and the patient. We're also going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to do a little bit of role playing and demonstrate some various ways of communicating. So with your permission, Jonathan, I'm going to just jump right in. Let's start out by talking about the importance of communication between the whole team, caregivers and everybody, and especially thinking about shared decision making and strategies to close the gaps. But let's start out with the problem of non-adherence. How common is that? For people on oral therapy with any chronic disorder, hypertension, schizophrenia, the rate of oral non-adherence is about 50%. And if you go out to longer time frames, it gets even larger. Mm. So I think it's important to realize that this is the norm for people on oral therapy. And you have to develop strategies for both talking to the patient about it, for talking to caregivers or those involved in their care, And normalizing the experience, not that we say it's okay to miss doses, but we must recognize this is part and parcel of any chronic disorder, which is relying on oral therapy. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And I'm just thinking about myself. I take a couple different oral medications. I take one for high blood pressure and cholesterol. And I don't think I could swear to you that I've faithfully taken every single pill that's ever been prescribed to me. And so... It's hard to imagine that we're going to expect our patients who may be cognitively impaired to to handle this, right? Well, certainly there's cognitive impairment, there can be lack of insight, and then there's basic attitude towards medication. Some Mm -hmm. have had issues with adverse effects. They Mm -hmm. may want to take therapy, but they don't like how it makes it feel for a variety of reasons. And if they don't like how it makes them feel, they're less inclined to take the medication. And Adherence is not necessarily binary, is it? It's not necessarily all or none. That's it. It's a distribution. When you look at even short-term studies where you have people who know that their pill taking will be measured using what's called a MEMS cap, which is an event monitoring chip in the pill bottle. Every time you open it, it's recorded. Mm -hmm. We see that about half of the people will take 80% of their doses. Mm -hmm. And then below that, we have a distribution from some taking virtually none to others between 60 and 80 And the other point I like to make is that adherence is dynamic. Mm -hmm. It is not static. Mm -hmm. People can be adherent for long periods of time, and this behavior may change, and vice versa as well. And that's why it's important to have ongoing strategies to mitigate this. And we'll talk about that in Mm -hmm. a second, but Mm -hmm. recognize that it may change over time. Even those who you may perceive as being very adherent, that may not be true in the future. Now, we certainly know that most of us overestimate treatment adherence. Of course, we always think our patients are taking all their medicine the way we <laughs> prescribe them. But the fact is that we, we tend to overestimate adherence. Why, why is that? There's a couple of reasons. I think partly is that many clinicians 
aren't mindful of the fact that adherence is dynamic mm -hmm. and that it changes over time. So there's an assumption that because this person has not been in the hospital for X number of years, they must be taking their medications regularly the way I prescribe them. And we know that to be false. Mm -hmm. Some clinicians erroneously rely on patient self-report, which is a very poor marker of adherence in all the studies which have looked at that. Mm -hmm. And also, we may falsely assume because we have good rapport with patients that they must be doing what we tell them to. Exactly. And there's a great study which illustrates this. This was a large international study of over 1,300 psychiatrists, including trainees. And the people who had more experience were actually more likely to rate their patients as being more adherent, despite all evidence to the contrary. Wow. <laughs> and what happens is, I don't want to say we become self-deluded as providers, but we're better at talking to people. We think our patients like us, and therefore mm -hmm. they must be doing things the way we prescribe it, and it has nothing to do with it at all. Mm. And that's really critical. And, and, and we talk about relapse, and I think most people think about that's going to be the consequence of non-adherence, but it's not just that the person's going to end up in the hospital, but there may be other consequences too. They can lose friendships, they can lose family, they can lose their housing, they mm. can end up in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And there's even a great study out of Canada, which looked at people after their first episode. These are people who responded to an antipsychotic, were then non-adherent, and many of them no longer responded to the same antipsychotic the second time around, oh even if the dose was advanced. So oh repeated non-adherence may adversely affect the course of the illness. And this is why we're gonna talk about in a bit even first episode patients need to be tracked for adherence and all efforts need to be undertaken to try to get them to stay with their treatment. Well, speaking of that, what are some, some ways that we can accurately monitor adherence and are there measures or objective markers we can use? Among the things which are not just research only, the MEMS cap, although it sounds like a great idea, is not available at your local CVS, <laughs> unfortunately. It would be nice. It'd be nice to know. And that technology is coming. It's coming very soon, but it's not available just yet. Mm -hmm. Pill counts, mm -hmm. evidence-based, easy to do. You mm -hmm. could even do it via tele. You get the patient on the Zoom interface or whatever you're using, have them go bring their pills back and you sit there and count them together mm -hmm. and find out exactly how many doses are left based upon their refill status. Mm -hmm. A refill status is another way you get information from the pharmacy, although that mm -hmm. lags often significantly behind the problem of adherence. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually direct measurement of antipsychotic drug levels. For many antipsychotics, which have been out more than five years, you can actually order trough plasma antipsychotic levels, mm -hmm. just like you might order a level in somebody who's taking lithium or Dival mm -hmm. X, mm -hmm. just as a way to track adherence. Mm -hmm. And research has shown that people who are adherent with their oral antipsychotic their trough level will fluctuate roughly less than 30%. You have to allow a little wiggle room for the timing of the dose, the timing of the level, things of that sort. But if you see 50% or more jumps in what's supposed to be a 12-hour trough level, there's a problem. And that will alert you just the way it might for somebody who comes up with their low lithium level on their routine six-month check that you have to have a discussion with the patient about what's going on and what can we do to make this better. Yeah, and Jonathan, you've recently written a book on plasma levels of antipsychotics. Is that correct? It is. And really, a lot of this information was what I learned when I was reading about how you can use levels to track adherence, because it's in the literature, but it was hard for many clinicians to find. And they often wanted to know, for example, if I order a level in somebody on 20 of oral air peppers all at bedtime, what, what do I even expect <laughs> as the number? <laughs> and so I provided that information and also how do you use levels not only for efficacy optimization, but to track oral medication adherence. Great. I hope that a lot of people check out your book and, and it helps improve their practices. Speaking about communication strategies here, it, it seems that asking a patient about their experience in taking the medicine might be a better way than asking direct questions about non-adherence. So what are some communication strategies that clinicians can use to improve adherence? 
certainly early in treatment. And so you have the first episode patient or maybe somebody who's new to your practice. It really is important to understand their attitude towards medication. There's actually instruments out there called the drug attitude inventory used mostly for research purposes, but just even querying about their attitude often is a big clue about what might be a problem with adherence. They just don't think they need it or they don't like it, but that's important information so you can decide together what's gonna be the best strategy to manage their illness. As you alluded to, they may have cognitive issues as well. There's too many meds, it's complicated. They have to take some at night, some with food. They don't know what they're supposed to do. You just have to find out what the issues are were there certain side effects, which they may have had, and if they mm-hmm. don't take doses, they think this gets better, mm-hmm. and look at the whole picture to try to understand why for that person are there particular difficulties, knowing, again, that non-adherence is very common in schizophrenia as it is with all chronic disorders. Yeah, we almost have to assume that our patients are being non-adherent at least part of the time, don't we? I think that is the norm, and I think that's a reasonable assumption. But most important in this day and age, it's measurement-based care. Mm -hmm. Find a way to track, whether it's pill counts, whether it's plasma levels, but you cannot just rely on your gut sense of what's going on or patient self-report. Okay. We are now going to do a little role play, Jonathan, and we're going to show examples first of not the best practice of how to communicate, and then we'll do an example of a better practice. How's that sound? That sounds great. Okay. So if you can put on your patient hat, I'm going to be the doctor. Are we ready? I'm ready. All right. So it's good to see you today, Jonathan. Are you taking your medication? Yeah, I take it. You don't ever skip doses, do you? I might have once in a while. You're not going to get better if you don't take your medication. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, of course, how did that make you feel? (laughs) Yeah, not so good. Not so good. We don't want to be accusatory. We don't want to be pedantic or too paternal. I think it's much better if we communicate in a more effective way. So let's try a different strategy. Okay. All right, Jonathan, it's nice to see you today. Many people will miss some of their doses of their medication over the course of a month. It's pretty common. How many times do you think you might have missed taking your antipsychotic in the past month? Yeah, probably a couple times a week, I think. Okay. Is there any reason you can think of why you miss some doses? Sometimes people just forget, but sometimes they don't like certain side effects and skip the medicine to see if that helps. Sometimes the medicine makes me feel a little sleepy. Mm -hmm. I'm gaining some weight too. And I don't know, I figure if I miss a dose here or there, maybe I won't be so hungry. Yeah, I can understand that. I hear that about feeling sleepy and weight gain a lot. What are the other things that you taught you you might bother you? And it's embarrassing. I don't know. It's, oh. it's, uh, don't be embarrassed. Well, I hear lots of side effects from medicines that people don't want to talk about, like sexual side effects. Well, that's it, actually. And it's funny. I don't think any any other clinicians ever asked me about that. But when I take the medicine all the time, I, I kind of, I can't get it up. And it's, I don't like that. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for being a good sport. Um, and and I, this is very important because this, this sexual function is something that we don't always ask about. It's a very important part of patients' lives. And even if they don't have a partner, I've had many patients who talk to me very actively about their masturbation or their, their fantasy life and things like that. So it can be a very important part of someone's life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is one that patients are often reluctant to talk about. And really, to be honest, they get the cue from the providers because the providers never ask. Mm-hmm. And therefore, the patients are given sort of the tacit message, we don't talk about this or this is your stuff and I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. And that's the mm-hmm. exact opposite. It's a very common reason for people to be non hit with their medications. There's this great study, which we cite all the time by D. Bonaventura, which mm-hmm. surveyed hundreds of chronic schizophrenia patients mm-hmm. about various side effects. And regardless of what the cluster was, whether it was weight gain or sedation or what we call EPS related things or endocrine problems, which are usually sexual dysfunction function, sometimes some others, Mm -hmm. it didn't matter. They were all associated with non-adherence. And it's important really to check all those boxes mentally, especially with a newer patient, to figure out what's going on and what maybe is being missed in their treatment and understanding from their perspective what they don't like. 
Yeah. I frequently say nobody wakes up in the morning and is excited to take an antipsychotic today. We don't want to give people reasons to not take their medicines. And these kinds of side effects are all great excuses for not taking a medicine. And people can be embarrassed and, and just not want to tell us that they've stopped the medicine because they don't want to let us down or something like that. You know, it's very important, as you mentioned, to ask questions about the patient's attitude and any challenges they're facing. And that can include cognitive impairment, their home situation, lack of supports, lack of access to get the medicine refilled, their healthcare delivery. What are some examples of how we might be able to probe and query a little more about some of these things? I think really it, it's just being complete. You should always understand what is the living situation for that particular person. Mm -hmm. Where are they at? What kind of support do they have there? There are some what we'd call a boarding care in California where the caregivers there are wonderful. They really function like case managers. They'll take people to appointments when that's permissible. They'll make sure things don't run out at the pharmacy. If the patient's not looking good, they'll give you a call. They really provide an excellent resource for the patient. On the other hand, there's places which literally do virtually nothing except perhaps mm -hmm. feed them, and that's even debatable. <laughs> yeah. And if the medicine's dispensed, it's dispensed in sort of a casual manner. It's like I put the pill by their plate, and it's their job to take it, the thing, mm -hmm. and everything in between. Also, especially in this era of COVID where people may not want to go out, what's the transportation situation? Yeah. Many patients were independent before. They could take a bus someplace, but now they're fearful. Mm -hmm. And so what does that present? How are they going to get their prescription? How are they going to go to a lab? You have to understand all of these things so that you can now troubleshoot. If there's resources in your community to do Medication delivery. A lot of pharmacies will do delivery. Well, that's wonderful. Can, if they're getting a long-acting injectable, get it at home? Can a staff member go to a home delivery? Can they go to a pharmacy, which is maybe closer to them, to get the injection instead of coming to the clinic? Mm -hmm. You have to be creative in finding solutions. And for most people, there really are solutions, but you have to understand the nature of the problem. I think you're right, Jonathan. I think to be a good clinician is to be curious. And that's essentially what we're talking about. You just need to adopt a curiosity about that individual patient, their situation, what their attitudes are, what's important to them, what matters to them. Some side effects are more troublesome than others to certain individual patients. And you can't assume. And sometimes it's not even the patient. The patient themselves may want to take medication, but maybe they are living with family members mm -hmm. who have mm -hmm. a certain bent upon psychiatry mm -hmm. and psychiatric medications, yeah. and they're constantly getting this negative message about the medications, which they think are important for their mental health, but somebody there is constantly telling them the opposite. So you have to, again, just talk to the people, find out what's going on in their lives, inquire more beyond how are your voices, and get yeah. a sense of what can I do to make this person's life better? Yeah. And one of the options, which I'll we'll talk about, especially when there's conflicts at home over medication, whether it's the patient doesn't want to take it and the family does, mm -hmm. or vice versa, is sometimes having a long-acting injectable. The shot's there, yes. nobody sees them taking a pill every day, and there's Absolutely. less fights within Absolutely. you know a conflicted environment about mm -hmm. daily pill taking. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, there's that da daily battle. Did you take your medicine? Did you take your medicine? And so an LAI removes that. Also, I had a patient one time, I'll never forget, and this was something I hadn't even considered. And I was talking to him about an LAI and he said, hey, that sounds great. I don't have to take a, you know, a pill every day. I said, no, why is that so great? He said, taking a pill every day is a daily reminder that I'm crazy. And that just really hit me. I hadn't thought of it. I think, and we'll talk about this, there's been some impediments to offering patients LAIs who, quote, mm -hmm. look stable, mm -hmm. not appreciating, for one thing, that a lot of these people are not adherent anyhow, mm -hmm. and you're just not aware of it. And also, some of the reasons people like LAIs are not our reasons, but the patient's reason. It's convenient, or yes. maybe it removes, as you say, a daily reminder of an illness that they wish they didn't have. Yes. All right, let's shift gears here. Before we get specifically into LAIs, let's talk a little about the role that social aspects of community and behavioral health settings have on patients' experiences and even treatment outcomes for schizophrenia. How can we improve education in the community about the treatment options for schizophrenia? I think part of it is recognizing that our role as clinicians 
is to not only treat the people in front of us, mm -hmm. but to really raise the greater awareness of the needs of individuals with severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. For many folks in the community who don't have a loved one with an SMI, their perception is often the individual who is homeless, the individual who is violent, and there may be a very negative perception of what should be done for those types of people, I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. And I think our role should be one of outreach, because once there's an understanding of the nature of this illness, that there's treatment, that these people can often be maintained in the community, that most of them, in fact, are not violent mm -hmm. and are not a threat to other individuals, mm -hmm. Sometimes we start to get referrals for people who had not been getting treatment or suboptimal treatment because mm -hmm. there's a recognition, hey, maybe this person has something to offer you mm -hmm. and they seem reasonable and they seem to understand what's going on. I think also partly is that when you do have people living with family education really is critical. Mm -hmm. I talked about a very negative experience where the family is actually undermining treatment because of attitudes. But yes. sometimes it's not that bad. Sometimes it's simply they have unrealistic expectations of either what the medications can do mm -hmm. or what the patient should be able to do. And they become frustrated because the patient is not yet going back to college or getting a job, not fully <laughs> yes. understanding the illness. Yes, and exactly. of course, there can be conflicts over medication adherence as well, mm -hmm. which can uh, flare up from time to time when the patient becomes more symptomatic. Yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of treatment options, as you mentioned, out there. Increasingly, we have more. And while there, there's definitely some unmet need and room for further improvement, generally, we can find something that can help. I think the reason the FDA continues to approve new antipsychotics is often we have improvements in either drug kinetics mm -hmm. or drug tolerability. Mm -hmm. So tolerability meaning fewer adverse effects from what the mm -hmm. patient perceives. Mm -hmm. And kinetics often means the development of newer preparations, which allows mm -hmm. the patient to get their medication perhaps once a month, maybe even longer in a way that is convenient for them and assures mm -hmm. adherence. Yeah, we, we have some LAIs now that are stretching out the dosing intervals. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, twice a year preparation was just FDA approved. So really incredible. Yeah, yeah sure. it's really, once you get people stable, it often doesn't take much to keep them stable. There was a great paper mm -hmm. published mm -hmm. by Stefan Leuk recently mm -hmm. looking at the minimum effective dose to prevent relapse, and it's often oh. quite modest. Interesting. And the idea is that there are many patients, not all, who can be maintained with fairly modest exposures, mm -hmm. and you get out to six months, and the patient possibly, if they're a responder to that particular molecule, it becomes a great option. Now, there's other reasons we want to see people more often. And I know we've had other preparations with varying intervals from two weeks up to three months previously. Mm -hmm. But often clinicians like to see people more frequently just to see how they are doing, even mm -hmm. in the era of COVID, mm -hmm. just to see how they're doing. There's things, there's information that you just can't get sometimes via tele, which you can get when you see the person face to face. That's true. Now, how can we improve communication? with the caregivers and support systems? And how can we help patients and caregivers to feel empowered and educated? How can we improve communications and, and education? I think part of it is having a system which is in many ways, a wraparound form of care. Mm -hmm. That it's not just me and the patient in a dyad, but mm -hmm. us recognizing that we are part of a larger group mm -hmm. so that I'm not the only one which is available to provide care, support, education to the mm -hmm. people around the patient. So mm -hmm. they have resources which they can go to, and importantly, that they can be pointed to even if it's not within my clinic. So for example, there may be support groups which are not in my clinic, but which are very useful so they can connect with other families who are struggling with the same types of issues where they can learn about medication, where they can learn about options, where they can learn about strategies of dealing with their loved one who might be struggling with their severe mental illness mm -hmm. and provide them what they need so that they have the best tools available to help their loved one. And I think most importantly, just keeping the lines of communication open. Every once in a while, we'll have patients who say, I don't want you to talk to anybody and legally you have to respect that. But mm -hmm. I think as 
you develop rapport with an individual patient. Over time, you can usually say, look, it's important for me to be able to talk to this lady who runs your boarding mm -hmm. care because mm -hmm. she can call me if you're running out of medications. You may not even know that, so she can call me. Mm -hmm. She can tell me if you're having some difficulties or if you're having a concern, mm -hmm. and she can be somebody who can be helpful, not mm -hmm. somebody who's spying on you, but somebody who can be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And try to enlist as many allies as possible mm -hmm. because these are people who monitor the patient between visits, really. M many patients don't have a lot of social support and you want to use whatever is existing. And in part, particularly if patients are a bit more independent, maybe there's somebody around who can help, let's say, monitor pill taking, see other aspects of their life and provide that information in a way that we maybe we can forestall having folks relapse or end up back in the hospital. Yeah. And I think also other ways to help people feel empowered is to take advantage of some of the resources that are out there. Certainly there's online resources. We have a couple of different really responsible, <laughs> there's a lot of irresponsible information. If we're talking about Mental Health America, which I think used to be called the Mental Health Association, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, NAMI. There's a lot of those. And increasingly there's apps that are out there that can be helpful to people. You can use social media platforms, video conferencing and other things. So th there are lots of ways now that technology can be helpful to us. Certainly when we're talking about adherence specifically, I tell people you should use every tool you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Understanding that except for maybe pill counts and maybe plasma levels, the evidence base for some of these others is relatively limited. Do text reminders, conclusively improve oral medication adherence and schizophrenia. I don't think the data are there, but there's no side effects for a text reminder if the patient's agreeable to it. Mm -hmm. If there's an app which the patient is able to use on a smartphone, assuming they have access, use it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but there's no downside to trying, as I say, the full court press. Use all options possible when you have individuals on oral medication Given the nature and the prevalence of non-adherence, I think you'd like to say, look, I did everything I could to try to help this lady take her oral medication. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's now shift gears. Let's move into talking about LAIs. We've talked around this topic a little bit, but it, it turns out that there's a lot of, of issues re around communication that have to do with LAIs. And the first one, of course, is how do I introduce the concept of LAIs to a patient or a caregiver? Part of it, I think, realistically, is overcoming your own internal resistance to even having that discussion. There's a study out there where I think it was like 75% of clinicians said that they had offered their patients LAIs, <laughs> and only 21% of the patients when asked actually said, yeah, oh, yeah, they, they talked to me about it. So yeah. what happens is there's many clinicians for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's they're projecting their own needle phobia. Sometimes they have really misinformation about whether first episode or younger patients will even accept an LAI. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have this outdated perception that LAIs are only for the repeatedly non-adherent yeah. or yeah. a group that we often negatively st stigmatize and that everyone else should be left alone. And, and I think you really have to get out of that mindset that LAIs may be liberating for your patient. Mm -hmm. They may be freeing them of the burdens mm -hmm. of daily pill taking. And most importantly, there's assured adherence. Exactly when the needle went mm -hmm. into that patient's gluteus or deltoid, mm -hmm. and if they don't show up for their appointment, mm -hmm. you know exactly what to do about it and when it happened to. And that's yeah. why most of the research out there shows that when individuals are on an LAI, they overall have better psychiatric outcomes, usually in terms of relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you, you know right away when they've become non-compliant, you can intervene before it becomes a crisis. I've had, I've had some very interesting experiences around LAIs. And one of them is one time I was giving a talk and I always asked the audience, what's your perception of LAIs and this kind of thing. And one, one nurse, younger nurse practitioner, male, jumped up and said, I use LAIs first episode right out of the gate. I offer them right away. And I was really impressed with that. And, and anyone who's our era, Jonathan, when we were trained to reserve LAIs for the less adherent patient, that's partly because we trained before there was atypical LAIs. I thought that was really interesting. What can you say about that? There's now been a number of studies which have shown that 
first episode patients will accept an LAI. Mm -hmm. So you have to offer it to them mm -hmm. because they have the most to lose when they relapse. Mm -hmm. So the study mm -hmm. out of uh, Toronto by Takeuchi showed mm -hmm. that for one thing, you may increase the chances of them becoming a non-responder. Okay, that's a basic reason to try mm -hmm. to mitigate relapse. Right. These are individuals who often still have their social network, maybe employed or right. going to school, mm -hmm. living with family, that's All right. of that gets lost with repeated relapse. And then they develop the phenotype of the chronic schizophrenia patient living in a boarding house, mm -hmm. few social contacts, dissociated from their family. And this is just a sad outcome, which we think is all preventable. And most importantly, once the patient is a medication responder, there are a number of LAI options out there which can be used for that patient. Yes, there's some molecules for which there's no LAI option. I love talking about clozapine. There's no long-acting injectable clozapine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there are long-acting injectable options out there. Certainly. And I think preferentially, as you're treating younger patients, mm -hmm. it's important to find molecules which are, for one thing, highly tolerable, meaning mm -hmm. lower mm -hmm. adverse effect burden, especially mm -hmm. metabolic and endocrine. Mm -hmm. And also try to find those molecules which might have LAI, LAI options so mm -hmm. that you can transition them once you've found them to be a responder. Yeah, I want, the story I was just telling, I'm thinking about the nurse practitioner. I was asking him, why do you do that? How do you do that? Basically, I was mystified. And he said, if you offer this as an option right up front, then it's normal. It's just one of the normal ways that the medication is delivered. It's not so strange and foreign. Much like if you, God forbid, had cancer, went to the oncologist, you'd want to know about all the different treatment options. So it seems unfair that we deny the patients even the option by not talking about LAIs. I think these days we would say this is no longer acceptable. It's below the standard of care. You have to let people know mm -hmm. simply because they tend to do better. And that's what the research shows mm -hmm. that given the rate of oral non-adherence with all chronic illnesses, including schizophrenia, you have to let people know and you have to inform them in a fair and balanced manner. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be, you don't want a shot, do you? That's not really an informed <laughs> right. discussion. Exactly. Okay. This is a completely biased discussion and, and uh -huh. reflects poorly on whoever is going to say that. I hope that doesn't happen too often, but no. really, given the enormous benefits for patients on LAIs, the discussion really should be once you've shown the person to be a responder is exactly as you said. There's a lot of people who don't like taking their medicines every day, and we have these options now where mm -hmm. you can just get your shot, let's say once a month, mm -hmm. go about your business, and you don't have to take pills. Would you like that? And then you can have a discussion about that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't offer people the option, how are they going to know LAIs exist? They're not nurse practitioners. They're not psychiatrists. How are they going to know an LAI exists unless you actually describe it to them? Absolutely. And I think you'd be surprised. I think you mentioned earlier, a lot of times people are limited in their own thinking about LAIs, either because the way we were trained to think about them. You know, I always say we make people earn LAIs by being non-adherent and relapsing after relapse after relapse. And that just doesn't make sense because time is brain. You know, you're talking about potentially a neuroprogressive illness, a neurodegenerative illness. With each relapse episode, I think that's the idea, and you know, and that's and that's what these folks up in Canada mm -hmm. showed in, the, in that 2019. And that's why I cited a lot. It's not just an issue of oh, she'll end up in the hospital. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not good either, by the way. <laughs> but sometimes it's not the hospital that you end up in, but it's the city jail, and that that's a bad outcome. Well, and sure. guess what? You may be modifying the course of their illness as well. Yeah. So, so let's flip that on its head and say. My job is to do everything I can to prevent relapse because I know this first episode of schizophrenia patient is going to be as non-adherent as the chronic patient. It's just the nature of the disorder. Well, as you mentioned, we want to avoid that, quote, phenotype of the chronic schizophrenic because isn't there research that the, how well you do your whole life with schizophrenia depends on how much of the first three years you have an antipsychotic in your brain? Isn't it something like that? There's clearly some debate about there. Are there a scrub group of people who maybe clearly have schizophrenia, but can do without antipsychotics. But the vast majority do very poorly if they have inadequate treatment. And as you said, it's, it's a disease-modifying event when folks have relapse. It may alter the entire course of their illness for the worse. Yeah. All right. So I'm just I'm just interested by that you, you quoted that uh, study, I believe it was by Jerez, 
from 2006, the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, that 75% of clinicians said they offered their patient an LAI, but only 21% of the patients said that their doctor had discussed it with them. That's an incredible yeah. disconnect. <laughs> It's unfortunate, and we hope this will change over time, especially if we have more, as we have more and more studies looking at the use of LAIs, especially in first episode patients. And I think that's where mm -hmm. the greatest opportunity is, although realistically, if you look at the numbers, there's an opportunity for half your patients. Half of your patients are not adhering by whatever metric you want to use. Mm -hmm. But certainly, we feel like uh, there's a great opportunity now because the first episode patients were often those who were never offered LAIs in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. we think that's not a discussion which is which should be avoided anymore. And yeah. all the research done with first episode patients show that a large proportion of them will accept an LAI. Mm -hmm. I think the other point here is that you shouldn't look at it as if you have to get that decision right now. You don't have to close the deal. In other words, you're starting a discussion. Someone may say no at first, but you want to continue the discussion, continue to offer it uh, because they may eventually come around. Yeah, so that same author, Jerez, has another paper in 2011 where they surveyed almost 200 psychiatrists mm -hmm. on their attitude towards offering mm -hmm. depot treatment to first episode patients. Mm -hmm. And out of 12 factors which are suggested, the psychiatrists only said there were three that might influence their decision. One of them was the limited availability of different second generation LAIs, mm -hmm. the frequent rejection of the depot offer by the patients, mm -hmm. and sometimes the patient's skepticism based upon the lack of experience in relapse, which is often common in the first episode patient mm -hmm. who has responded robustly and hasn't had a relapse yet. Mm -hmm. But I think the point being is that you can't control what's in the market, but there's enough of a spread of second generation LAIs that you do have options. Mm -hmm. And as you say, just because somebody says no once doesn't mean it's no forever. Mm -hmm. You have to be a little bit of a, I don't want to say used car salesman because you're not selling them anything which you don't think is to their benefit. Mm -hmm. But as you see individuals who have struggled with adherence, mm -hmm. our job is to say, hey, how can I put you into an LAI today? And just continue the discussion mm -hmm. just in the way you might have an ongoing discussion with somebody who really needs clozapine. And they say no now and they give you all the reasons. But guess what? Your job is to say, hey, I don't think other things are going to work for your problem other than clozapine. And let's continue the discussion. Mm -hmm. The same with somebody who struggles with ongoing oral adherence. We mm -hmm. think for many people, the best solution to that problem will be an LAI. Mm -hmm. And you continue the discussion. So it's not just one no and that's it. We never talk right. about it again. No, I think our responsibility, as you said, is to say, look, I have this effective treatment option. And using motivational interviewing techniques, this is uh, something that can help you achieve your goals, get you where you want to go. I think you get buy-in that way. What you're using is what we'd call a shared decision-making concept. Mm -hmm. Find out what's important to them mm -hmm. and then see if we can all kind of row in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So maybe what's important to them may not be what's important to me, but mm -hmm. if we feel like it's going to lead to a common shared goal, mm -hmm. that's fine. So, for example, many clinicians only felt like it was important to them to mitigate relapse and never even considered the fact that LAIs might just be really convenient. I mean, hey, guess mm -hmm. what? You get two shots a year. That's mm -hmm. pretty darn convenient. Even once a month is more convenient than having to remember to take a pill on a daily basis, which many mm -hmm. people struggle with. Sure. So I think it's important to see what the patient themselves values. Maybe mm -hmm. their issue had to do with adverse effects and which ones they value. Maybe it was sexual dysfunction, which nobody ever asked about. Okay. Maybe it was weight gain. Maybe it was something we didn't appreciate until we asked about. See what they value and then see where we can find some common ground to move forward. You just reminded me there's another side effect that I've had patients complain bitterly about, and that's constipation. That's not something we typically ask about or think about. So it could be a lot of different things. I'm thinking back to the resistance. Let's think about the resistance of the provider versus the resistance of the patient to considering an LAI. We talked about some of the issues with the provider being maybe lack of familiarity or I wasn't trained to think of LAIs early on. But there's another issue too. There's the practicality of, in, 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 of giving the injection, of administering the medication. And do I have the resources to do it? Do I have a nurse who can do it? Can I do it? Is there some place I can get them to get it? So how do we overcome that kind of thinking? 
I think if you are an individual in private practice who does not have a nurse or somebody who can give injections, it does become a little daunting. There's also needle storage issues, there's some OSHA requirements mm -hmm. for disposing of needles and such. Most of these injections in many states can be delivered at pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And so that mm -hmm. becomes an option many ways for individuals to get their injection where you don't have to deal with the needles and the other issues of drug mm -hmm. storage and documenting that and people can get their treatment. In some instances, there may be mobile services who can go mm -hmm. out, deliver mm -hmm. medicines, draw bloods, and also give injections. So that's mm -hmm. a way to work that out. And sometimes there are clinics in the community who specialize in providing a depot service. So I know in San Diego, some clinicians who are in private practices but have a small group of schizophrenia patients but feel like for them to do the injection themselves is a little difficult. If the patient doesn't have a, doesn't have a primary care provider who's willing to do that, they have this one psychiatric hospital which seemingly is happy to do that and they provide that resource. So I think mm -hmm. the idea is you just have to find something if you feel like you can't do the injection yourself so that you don't deprive people of evidence-based treatment. And, and that's really what it comes down to. This is evidence-based treatment, and you have to find a way to give it to people. Mm -hmm. That certainly makes sense. How should we communicate with the patient and their caregiver about LAIs? What kind of information do they need? The basic one is they have to know that they exist. <laughs> and I said that before, but if you never talk about it, how they're going to know, it's like clozapine. You never mention to people how they're going to know this thing even exists. Mm -hmm. You have to let them know what the options are and normalize it as well. Normalize the fact that some people don't like taking pills every day. It's a pain. This is more convenient. So you can talk about the convenient option, why the benefit is that way. And for somebody who may have struggled with adherence, you can talk about how this may be helpful in that sense as well. They just have to show up once a month, whatever the interval is, get their injection, go about their business. Certainly, if there have been some conflicts in this housing situation about oral medication adherence, it also removes that as well. And talk to them about drug kinetics. I'm not saying they have to understand the CMAX and TMAX and pass the post-test at the end uh -huh. of the uh, session, but just give them a sense that these are not short-acting medicines because for many people, the needle has been, I hate to say, an instrument of punishment. I was agitated and they sat on my head and they injected me with this stuff. And so you have to explain to people, these things usually kick in very slowly. The drug builds mm -hmm. up over a period of days and weeks, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So they understand what the experience will be when they get a shot, which may be hundreds of milligrams that, hey, guess what? This happens very slowly. And to be honest, sometimes I'll actually show patients kinetic curves mm -hmm. because they'll see visually, oh, this is what would happen if I took the oral medicine. And then this is how the injection builds up and they get to the same point. But, but actually, the injection gets there a little more slowly. Mm -hmm. People like that. Mm -hmm. you know, they can appreciate the fact that you're showing them some information. It's just not some abstract. There's Meyer again talking about CMAX and TMAX. And I don't know what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> By the way, I usually don't use those words in front of no patients course. or caregivers, no but course. I will explain the concept it builds up over time. Yes. But a picture is sometimes worth a thousand words it can be very helpful when folks are wondering, you're going to inject me with how many hundred milligrams of, of what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, I think you're absolutely right. I think visual aids are always really helpful. And also the other thing that I like to do is I like to have the patient or the caregiver repeat back to me what they've heard or what the instructions are that I might have given them because I can't tell you how often you tell them, they look at you, they nod, and, and then they mess it up. So it's very important to get them. And sometimes yeah. they only hear part of what you're saying. So it's really absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. Provide things in writing. I, I do that yeah. all the time. And, yeah. and most clinics often have one-page sheets about drug X. This is what to expect, things mm -hmm. of that sort. Mm -hmm. And I try to go over any concerns which people have also about the duration of action. What if I have a side effect? Often, I really will try to establish not only tolerability with the oral agent, but efficacy too. Mm -hmm. So this way I can say you tolerated this dose of medication and the drug level provided by this injection is going to be comparable. So mm -hmm. we should not anticipate anything new or different because you're mm -hmm. already taking, and your body's already exposed to the equivalent amount of medication. Mm -hmm. That certainly makes sense. We have not talked about the elephant in the room here, <laughs> and that is the COVID 
crisis, the COVID pandemic. And that's obviously introduced all kinds of changes and complications in how we deliver care. Let's talk a little bit about the use of LAIs during the COVID pandemic. What are some of the issues around LAIs with the COVID pandemic? So there's two big issues. One is treatment delivery and the other is is monitoring. Mm -hmm. So treatment delivery, we've already touched on a little bit, is how does this patient get their medication, especially if they are leery about leaving the house, or maybe they don't have somebody who can bring them because the caregiver doesn't want to leave the house. Right. So 35-year-old schizophrenia patient, she lives with her 65-year-old mom. Maybe mom has some health conditions. Even if she's been vaccinated, doesn't really want to go out so much. And mom used to be the one bringing her to appointments. Right. So how do we deal with that situation? Mm -hmm. Often you have to be creative. Maybe there is somebody from the clinic, a case manager, who can Mm -hmm. go bring the patient in just for their LAI. Mm -hmm. All the other visits will be done via tele, which is fine, but they get brought in. Mm -hmm. Perhaps transportation can be arranged to bring the patient either to the clinic or Mm -hmm. or nearby pharmacy or wherever to Mm -hmm. get their injection. Every once in a while, there are mobile services, which are covered Mm -hmm. by Medicaid or insurance, Mm -hmm. which will be able to go out to the patient's residence and deliver the injection. But -hmm. I think the idea, and most people have already been doing this now over the past year and a half, is you troubleshoot. Early on, people were like, oh, don't come in. I'm going to give you oral. We realized that was the bad, that was the wrong answer. The right right. answer is give people exactly what they need Mm -hmm. for the most part and just find ways to do it. And I think a lot of people have done that. The second part is now just monitoring. And as I said, especially if you're starting somebody on an LAI, which they've already responded to, I think there should be no surprises. But sometimes that's not ideal because the patient's so non adherent with oral therapy, you don't really know what they tolerate that's right. or respond to. And then I think in that sense, it's just understanding the kinetics of the preparation, whether there's a need for oral overlap, and right. just understanding where the periods might be, where levels may drop, where the problems might be if the patient really won't take the oral in terms of achieving mm-hmm. relevant or therapeutic plasma levels mm-hmm. and being able to respond to that. And also just how to manage the routine adverse effects which might happen with any antipsychotic therapy. Sure, and also you still have to monitor the dose with an LAI, there are still different dose options and and with some of them different intervals. And so you you have to monitor that and make a decision about the dosing. Absolutely. When if you have a patient who's very nervous and you're seeing him or her primarily via tele, they should have a method of getting in touch with you, which I, I think everybody has. It's usually electronic. Mm -hmm. So that if they have some adverse effect, they don't have to wait a month to get in touch with you, but they can see you or at least contact you and then some type of intervention can be made. So if it's somebody who turns out, hey, guess what? Turns out you're really sensitive to D2 blockade and I shouldn't have given you an antagonist. Sometimes you only find this out after the fact because the person was so non-adherent. He said, we're just going to go in this direction because I got to give you something and I have a reason for choosing this particular molecule, Mm -hmm. and it turns out you're very sensitive to D2 blockade. Who knew? You have to find a way to manage that until a patient's plasma level drops enough that they don't have that adverse effect. Mm -hmm. And then you can hopefully now have the discussion, okay, we have other options here. This is not Mm -hmm. the only option. Not every medicine will cause this, Mm -hmm. and how can we move forward with another option for you? Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned that during the pandemic, of course, We've moved to telemedicine. So what challenges does telemedicine pose for the treatment of schizophrenia? I think there's just some global issues. <laughs> there are some people who really either have no access to, to technology, which has a visual component, or just can't manage it. Mm-hmm. And you can treat people on the telephone, but it's not ideal. And yeah. certainly, it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. We've all accepted that. But we would prefer to have the visual because you get all of that information. How does their grooming look? Mm-hmm. What does their attitude look like? Are they looking at me? Are they responding to stimuli? Right. What's the environment look like? Mm-hmm. All of that nonverbal can be very helpful in understanding what's going on. Sure. We can see movement disorders exactly. on telly. I can't. I can't touch you and see if you're rigid, but I can certainly get a good sense if you have a Parkinsonian tremor or tremor from your mood stabilizers. Mm -hmm. I can assess you for tardive dyskinesia pretty well via tele. And I can certainly have a nice face-to-face interview. All the research has shown that you can provide adequate psychiatric treatment You can do psychotherapy, you can treat PTSD, let's say in the VA system, you can treat major depression, Mm -hmm. schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. via telepsychiatry. There will be 
some limitations, though, for, for certain individuals. Another benefit that's surprising is when you do telemedicine, you can get a sense of the patient's environment. You see them in situ, if you will, or in vivo. Um, yeah, and an interesting adverse effect, and this is in the literature, and whenever I go to various clinics and visit them for a variety of reasons, they're all very consistent. They say, you know, our no-show rate is almost zero. It's, it's single. It's low single-digit percent. Right. And you can imagine, again, you had somebody with a serious mental illness. They don't drive. They were either relying on public transportation, which can be very daunting at times, or they were reliant on a caregiver, and they just had trouble making it to their appointments once they get the technology thing going, they just fire it up and there they are. And it really has, in many ways, improved the quality of care for a lot of people. Plus, if you live in an area where the patient is a distance from the clinic, it's a blessing for them. I live in a county, San Diego. They go, oh, this is a big city. There's places in San Diego County which are way, way out there. Yes. And these are people who live long distances from a clinic, and for them to be able to access their provider mm -hmm. via telepsychiatry is just a blessing for them. Everybody loves it. You can see their family if they allow you. You can talk to their caregivers, whoever. You can say, hey, how's Joan doing? Mm -hmm. How's Roger doing with his medicines? How's Jose doing? I saw. I remember last time he was depressed. Mm -hmm. They can tell you. And it just really becomes a, a really nice experience as opposed to we had to drive two hours to get you. There was traffic. We couldn't find a place to park and all mm -hmm. the other issues. Plus, you throw COVID on top of that, and exactly. it just uh, yeah. becomes a big trauma. So what we, one of the things we've learned here during the pandemic is that telepsychiatry can have advantages, and we've all learned how to adopt it. I, I think we're going to be in a hybrid world from now on. We're all probably going to incorporate some aspects of it into our practice. And there are challenges, of course, and issues. And I want to give out a, a resource, if I could. There actually are telepsychiatry practice guidelines that are you can access online from the American Psychiatric Association. So if you go to the APA's website, it's psychiatry.org, and you go to their psychiatry tool. There's a toolkit and you can look up telepsychiatry, and there's actually practice guidelines that can give you all kinds of helpful tips. We would like to think everyone's an expert at this point, yeah. but I just do want to remind people there's just some important practical things. Make sure you have good bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have adequate lighting so you don't look like you're in a horror movie and you're lit from below. <laughs> and people, how are you today? And I go, oh, my God. Uh, make sure the patient is comfortable with their technology, that you can see them adequately, that they are well lit, and also that, that you know where they are at. Because every once in a while, people are doing poorly, they are suicidal, they are in crisis, and you're going to have to get some resources out to them. You need to know where they're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And also, it's nice sometimes to have a caregiver or helper or someone else in the room who can maybe help, especially as you mentioned, if you're monitoring for movement disorders, maybe they can help move the, the camera around or something like that. There's also, uh, of course, potential reimbursement issues. There's safety issues, having a plan. One of the things that is very important, of course, is if you can get the patient's phone number right away and their location in case you have to call them back or, God forbid, there's an emergency and you have to get them help. So there's all kinds of best practices there. So talking about technology and telemedicine, when we talk about telemedicine, there's also various technologies that can assist us. And we mentioned earlier texting, emailing. There's, as we know now, a plethora of apps out there. And some of these apps can mo help with monitoring people. Some of them can help with connecting to uh, your smartphones. What are some of the ways that these various things can help with adherence? I think whatever we can do to remind people to take the medicines who are on oral therapy. Again, there's some people for whom an LAI is not available and they are on oral therapy. And as I said before, use every option possible. Play with some of the apps, find ones which you think your patients like, or ask your patients, hey, which ones do you use? Mm -hmm. Find out what's available. See if your patient actually has a smartphone and if he or she can use it. It's just, if you're, you're talking to somebody who has limited income, the only phone they have may be a very simple phone and perhaps is, is not a smartphone. That's less common these days, but it's still an issue for some individuals. They still make pillboxes which have reminders on them. Mm -hmm. They make pillboxes which have timers on them. Mm -hmm. 
use whatever you can. The text option. Mm -hmm. I know there's a company out there. This is the company Athelis, which makes a finger stick device for uh -huh. neutrophil counts for clozapine, mm -hmm. but they're also working on an interface which will help monitor oral medication therapy. Mm -hmm. So they have the base unit has six holes for your six pill bottles. And every time you take the pill bottle out, the assumption is you're going to take your medicine. Okay. It's an assumption, but it's a pretty good one. And it can record this via technology, be connected to the internet, and it can help record medication adherence. Uh -huh. And it's just another way that technology is evolving to help track oral medication taking mm -hmm. for patients who are on oral therapy. Yeah, and we've also mentioned another way that this that, uh, video conferencing can help with adherence, and that is the fact that no-show rates are, are much lower. So now you have the opportunity to address whatever issues there are with adherence rather than if the patient just doesn't show up to the clinic, then you can't help them, obviously. There, there is one intervention, which I don't use a lot of, but I was talking to a group here at the Balboa Naval Medical Center, which is a large first episode program. They'll actually have people videotape them taking their pills. They'll actually do it on a smartphone. These are usually people who are a little higher functioning, but some have mm -hmm. schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And they'll actually just say, just take a little movie of you swallowing your pill because mm -hmm. we'll know exactly what time you did it. Mm -hmm. And you just send it to us and there's a box they can send it to. <laughs> uh -huh. And it's just wow. a way of Great. them knowing you're helping them stay on track. Oh. Yes, it, it is a big brother aspect. But really, if they're struggling with this, you're like, this is us helping you. Because, you know, we'll be looking for that video and if it doesn't uh -huh. appear, then we, we have a sense that maybe you're having some difficulty. Yeah, and I think we should give out some resources here that there, there are, these apps are proliferating like crazy. There's actually two, two apps that are interesting. One's called Focus, which targets schizophrenia self-management. The other one is Prime, P-R-I-M-E, which helps with social connection and depressive symptoms. And these have demonstrated to be uh, potentially effective. There's also a couple of places where you can go that help um, with sorting through all these apps. And one is called Cyber Guide. Uh, and there's one called MindTools.io. And really, probably, Jonathan, we should give out the, uh, the reference that a lot of what we're talking about today came from is, is a really terrific article. It's called Community Mental Health Care Delivery During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Practical Strategies for Improving Care for People with Serious Mental Illness. And first author is Sarah Kapelovich, K-O-P-E-L-O-V-I-C-H, Kapelovich. And this is from the Community Mental Health Journal. It was published a year ago, a little over a year ago, June of 2020. But I just found this to be a tremendous resource and gives out some really helpful places to go for more information. Yeah, it is. It has a lot of resources, and they talk about really everything that's available. As they say, natural supports as extensions of the clinical team, like warm lines or crisis mm -hmm. lines that people can call, yeah. finding resources for advanced directives in case they get COVID. So Obviously, most people know how to use telehealth. Mm -hmm. and finding how to use technology to help assess your patient, both from the psychiatric perspective, as well as adverse effects. And to be honest, we haven't talked about it a lot, but a big problem for a lot of people during the pandemic has been substance use, yes. having resources to get people treatment because mm -hmm. it's not going away. There's going to be a problem for a while. A lot of people have now resorted to other types of medications in addition to the things we're prescribing, and yep. these become often a source of difficulties. This pandemic has had an amazing impact. We know that people who have struggled with substance abuse, the pandemic has unfortunately increased you know, relapse rates for a variety of reasons, the stress, the fact that you don't have access maybe to your support systems, to your, your treatments. It, it's just really induced a whole lot of issues that complicate the way we take care of our folks. Yeah, I think it's been an interesting year and a half, but the hybrid model is going to be with us forever. Again, just from the basic reason that for some people, it's just a long distance to come to the clinic. For those people, absolutely, the idea that they have to drive 60 miles for any reason is just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly other reasons why telepsychiatry may exist for other individuals as well. And I think having now spent a year cutting our teeth on this, so to speak, mm -hmm. we should all be experts at using both methods and all the tools available regardless to give our patients the best chance at a good outcome. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think 
Two, we need to be aware of the fact that there's increasing evidence that people with severe mental illnesses are at increased risk of contracting COVID, unfortunately, as are those with substance abuse for a whole variety of reasons. And I think that in thinking about taking care of the mental health needs of our patients, we should also be mindful of their physical health. And we need to pay attention to that. And we're in a position, I think, to help counsel people about COVID-19 as well. And also, importantly, there now are mobile monitoring services, which can help do metabolic monitoring. Mm -hmm. So again, the same company, Athelis, mm -hmm. has created a service in many metropolitan areas where they will go out and measure blood pressure, weigh people, get the metabolic labs. So if you have people who are still reluctant to go out, even if they're vaccinated, that's fine. Mm -hmm. This may be just one of many tools that can be used to keep track of the entire patient and not neglect some of those physical aspects, which we know are going to be highly prevalent among a group of individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Well, great. Jonathan, this has been a wonderful discussion. We've talked about a whole range of different topics surrounding the issues of communicating and collaborating to try to improve adherence and outcomes in our patients with schizophrenia. I've certainly learned a lot from talking with you, as I always do. So I want to thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. And I just the marching orders for everybody are really measurement-based care, learn how to track adherence, don't rely on your gut sense or patient self-report, mm -hmm. and get really good at talking to people about LAIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And consider LAIs. Figure out what are your obstacles and barriers to offering them to your patients and how can you communicate best with patients and caregivers to, to help increase the use of them. All right. Well, thank you all very much for uh, listening to this uh, podcast. And please don't forget to check out all of our other wonderful podcasts uh, wherever you get your podcasts from NEI. Thank you very much. This is Andrew Cutler signing off till next time. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation.